This is the 1219C2 combat knife, or as the rest of the world knows it, the K-Bar. Probably the most recognizable knife from World War II, the K-Bar was a staple of the Pacific Theater, serving with both the U.S. Marine Corps as well as the Navy. Look at any picture of the Pacific Theater and you are likely to find a K-Bar. Today, we are going to be looking into the design and history of this legendary knife. Let's get into it. The K-Bar is a pretty simple knife in both design and construction. Both the blade and guard are made from stamped steel. The grip is a through tang with stacked leather washers, and a simple disc pommel is either pinned or peened into place. With a 7-inch blade, or about 18 centimeters, it's not a particularly large blade, but it definitely isn't a small blade either. You'll find simple fullers on both sides of the blade and an unsharpened clip point. The knife's metal components are almost always parkerized to prevent corrosion, although some, especially early knives, were blued. It's not a pretty knife, it's not an expensive knife, and it's certainly not a luxury knife. And that's largely the point of the K-Bar. It is a munitions grade weapon meant to be manufactured in mass to arm troops in a war on a global scale. Stamped blades and guards made from 1095 steel mean easy and quick production with reasonable performance. Milling fullers into either side of the blade reduced weight and also doubled as a means of helping to straighten blades that came out slightly bent after stamping. Leather was not impacted as hard by wartime rationing. It was cheap and it was easy to stamp washers out of. Stack a bunch of washers together and you got a halfway decent grip. Throw a simple pommel that could be turned on a lathe by a rookie machinist and you had a serviceable knife that you could make by the hundreds of thousands. And they did. But what really cemented the K-Bar's place as a favorite of US troops was its design as a dual purpose utility and fighting knife. Previous 20th century military knives had largely been designed only as fighting knives. In the context of trench raiding in World War I, it made perfect sense to carry a pure combat knife. After all, you were sneaking across no man's land to kill anyone you could find and then sneak back to your trenches before daybreak. The new war in the Pacific demanded a new kind of knife. Something that could be used to storm an enemy position, but could also dig a foxhole, open your rations, prepare shelter, and perform any other task thrown at it. The USMC K-Bar isn't a great knife for any particular thing. It's not a great fighting knife, and it's not a great camp knife. But it was a jack of all trades that could do everything good enough to get the job done. And that was precisely why it was the perfect knife for the Pacific. The story of the K-Bar starts with a company called Union Cutlery. Union Cutlery had started off as a manufacturer of straight razors and had expanded out into hunting and general outdoor knives in the early 1900s. In 1924, Union Cutlery started an interesting habit of stamping its knives with a new trademark, K-Bar. The exact origin is not known exactly, but there is a popular story behind this. Supposedly, an Alaskan trapper was attacked by a Kodiak bear. His rifle had malfunctioned, and he was being mauled by the bear when he drew his Union Cutlery knife and managed to kill the beast with it. In gratitude, the trapper sent a letter to Union Cutlery thanking them for the knife that had saved his life and detailing his encounter, along with the skin of his assailant. Being a relatively uneducated gentleman, his writing was quite atrocious to the point where the words kill a bear uh, read as K-Bar. Interestingly enough, an original 1949 company sales manual for Union Cutlery directly references the story, further stating that the bear pelt at the company at that time was from that exact bear. Now, if you've ever seen a bear up close, you might be inclined to take that story with a grain of salt, and I wouldn't blame you. But, let's be honest, a letter from a grizzled old trapper saying he killed a Kodiak with one of your hunting knives is a great story and a better endorsement, true or not. So my question for you this video is, do you think the K-Bar Bear story is true, or was it just a cool marketing scheme? Let me know in the comments below. Regardless of the new trademark, 
business was difficult for Union Cutlery. The Great Depression had taken grip of the United States, and business everywhere was uncertain. That would change on December 7, 1941. The surprise attack and the crippling of the Pacific Fleet shocked and enraged the U.S. population. Further defeats as the Japanese struck across Pacific Islands added to the desperate situation. The entrance of the U.S. into the war brought with it full mobilization of its armed forces. The issue that has plagued military mobilization since the dawn of warfare has been logistics, though. What do you arm your soldiers with? The U.S. did have a number of older blades left over from World War I, such as the 1917 trench knife, but they were poorly suited for this new kind of warfare. The Brits' answer to the problem was the creation of the Fairbairn Sykes knife, which was essentially copied by Lieutenant Colonel Clifford Chewy to create the Marine Raider Stiletto, which was issued to several Marine battalions. Both of these knives were excellent fighting knives, but failed to hold up during more utilitarian work. Check out my video on the Fairbairn Sykes video for that full story. The USMC Utility Fighting Knife was Union Cutlery's solution to the challenges in the Pacific. The new K-Bar Knife was essentially a mixture of various hunting and camp knives popular in the United States, but designed for ease of manufacture. And who is behind this most American of knives? Why, Captain America, of course. But not that one. The masterminds of the K-Bar were Dan Firth Brown, the president of Union Cutlery, Colonel John Davis, and Captain Howard America. The Cap would get a promotion to Major shortly after the adoption of the K-Bar. These three men were the ones that had the most influence on the initial design and then pushed it through government procurement and into service. The K-Bar was adopted by the Marines in November 1942 and the first shipment left in January 1943. The K-Bar was now in the war. While Union Cutlery was the company that had created and promoted the new K-Bar, they were not the only producers of the knives. In fact, a cutlery firm named Camillus was the company to make that first shipment of newly christened Mark II combat knives in 1943. Other companies included PAL and Robison Shuredge. Individual competition was set aside by each of these knife companies in order to support the war effort. The name K-Bar would become associated with these knives due to Union Cutlery stamping the trademark on their knives. Overall features of the K-Bar remain the same, but variations in the grip, pommel, and finish identify particular knives that are of greater value to modern collectors. An interesting trend that can be observed is the curvature of the K-Bar's guard over time. Earlier blades often have straighter guards than later productions. So why did the K-Bar adopt this curvature in its guard? Old Marine veterans like to talk about how the back curve would help relieve the stress on a knife when parrying a cut from a Japanese sword. But as anyone who has been on the receiving end of a sword cut can say, it wasn't the actual reason. Union Cutlery and its fellow knife companies made sure to listen to the feedback coming back from the front. One of the issues troops encountered was the guard snagging on various things when moving in the jungle. The curvature was meant to help ease that. It was also very likely that the curvature in the guard arose from the stamping process and it was quicker just to assemble the knife with a curved guard than to correct it. The curved guard proved popular with the troops regardless and in many cases blades with straight guards were purposefully bent by troops in theater. Reworked K-bars turned out to be a fairly common thing. The knives endured brutal hard use and miserable conditions. One of their greatest weaknesses was their grip. While leather was an easy, fast, and inexpensive way to make a grip, it fared poorly in the tropical conditions of the Pacific. K-bar grips were known to rot in the island jungles along with the leather sheaths. In typical fashion, the Americans improvised and adapted. Some of the most famous examples of these were the stone knives. Eugene Stone was a naval crewman that worked in a ship's machine shop. He was able to cast spectacular replacement grips for the USMC knives. Some of these castings were even created from the remains of a Zero Fighter's cockpit. Of course, most repairs weren't so ornate, and attrition among utility knives was high. Few of the first-generation K-Bar knives remain. Most were destroyed with use. Initial generations of the Union Cutlery knives actually received a bluing finish for both the blade and the guard. Eventually, the blued finish was discarded in favor of a parkerized finish. 
Blades manufactured by Camillus, by large, were produced throughout the war with the parkerized finished, but a select number actually received a chrome plate finish, unique among all the K-Bar producers. Rubber spacers between the leather grip and the guard were also utilized for most of the knives. Interestingly, some Union cutlery knives made use of black washers, while others made use of red. There have been a number of questions as to the special significance of the color of the spacers used, but the reason behind it is pretty simple. It's what they could get their hands on at the time. While the K-Bar knife is usually known as the USMC utility fighting knife, the Marines weren't the only ones to take notice of it. The US Navy had been less than impressed with their issued USN Mark I knife. The Navy adopted the K-Bar pattern knife as its own as well, and classified it as the USN Mark II knife. By 1944, the K-Bar had found its way into the hands of the majority of Marines and was a common staple in the Navy as well. Despite its popularity in the Pacific, the K-Bar never made it to the European theater in significant numbers. The US Army opted to issue the M3 combat knife instead. If you have been enjoying this video, please consider getting a YouTube membership with the Knife Life. It's only a buck a month, and the funds collected go towards making these videos. If every subscriber was a member, we could make some seriously crazy videos. You can find the join button just below the video title. Now, let's take a look at the post-war K-Bar. Wartime production of the K-Bar had surpassed the needs of the military, and after the war ended, the government had massive stockpiles of leftover K-Bar knives on its hands. In fact, it had so many knives that it was able to continue issuing the K-Bar through the following Korean War and the Vietnam War. The military demand for knives dried up essentially overnight. Union Cutlery and the other knife makers were left with large stockpiles of parts for unassembled K-Bars and little to do with them. Ultimately, Union Cutlery opted to sell most of its inventory to another cutlery company, which used the leftover parts to assemble general hunting and camp knives after the war. While the K-Bar was no longer in production, its reputation still continued to grow. Many veterans opted to bring their trusty K-Bar knives back stateside with them and continued to use them in their civilian lives. Later generations of US veterans from Korea and Vietnam would also come to put their faith in the K-Bar. The K-Bar knife's reputation grew to such a degree that in 1952, Union Cutlery officially changed its name to K-Bar to match its own knife. In spite of that, the complete lack of demand for the knife meant that no further USMC knives were manufactured until 1975, when the K-Bar Knife Company decided to release a batch of commemorative fighting utility knives. To their surprise, there was a large demand for the knives in the civilian market and for soldiers looking to buy their own knife for their own use. K-Bar resumed production of its most famous knife, which continues to this day. If you enjoyed this video, take a look at some of my other videos. For the World War II enthusiasts, I recommend the videos on the Fairbairn Sykes Dagger and the Gurkha Kukri, but I have videos on many different blades. Take a look, and if you don't see what you are looking for, hit me up in the comments. This video was the result of comment requests. Until next time, stay safe and keep living the knife life.